Hey Rebels, my name is Matthew Barton, and I'm the host of the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. COVID-19 has changed all of our lives. For some of us, the global COVID outbreak is going to be a defining event that shapes the course of our lives, from the education we receive to the careers we choose, and much, much more. Many of us are likely reevaluating the things we think are the most important in life. At times, it seems one third of the population has succumbed to this delusional house of mirrors. Whether it's using magical crystals or dosing themselves with bleach, pouring oil in their ears or injecting it as an enema to safeguard or cure themselves from COVID, it's strange. Some have even taken to burning down 5G towers, and it's gotten to the point where others are ignoring orders to quarantine or socially isolate at all, even after a positive diagnosis with COVID. I think it's important to understand why people are behaving this way and what we can do to prevent harmful, self-destructive behaviors. Recently, I was speaking with a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist, and I started asking him a bunch of these questions about his perspective from the pandemic and its effect on mental health. And he said the guy I needed to talk to is Dr. Gordon Asmundson, a professor of psychology at the University of Regina. In fact, Dr. Asmussen recently received funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to look at the psychological factors of epidemics and pandemics and the impact COVID is having on Canadians. So let's get into it. Dr. Gordon, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Matt. How's it going? Well, you know, it's going pretty good. Um, after six going on seven weeks working here at home in, uh, you know, relative self-isolation and having uh, a young teenage boy at home from school for six weeks and a daughter who goes to college in the U.S. Uh, home now also for six weeks. It's, uh, yeah, it's going pretty good, all things considered. Well, why don't we start from the beginning? Why don't you tell me a little bit about your work and what it is you do? Yeah, I can certainly do that. So I've been a psychologist and a clinical psychologist for uh, a couple of decades. And most of my work has revolved around understanding and treating fear and anxiety related conditions. So, you know, focusing on those aspects of mental health. And while I do some clinical work, most of what I do, most of my time is spent doing research so that we can actually better understand why people uh, respond the way they do to certain stressors and certain threats and to uncertainties and unknowns, and then figure out ways to, to help them adapt and cope so that they can live healthy, productive lives. So, you know, COVID-19 is certainly one of those uh, situations where uh, there have been a lot of uncertainties. There's a lot of unknowns. There continue to be uncertainties and unknowns. And it's stressing some people out quite a bit. What are some of the questions that you're asking when it comes to your research? Yeah, so in terms of our COVID-19 work, we've been fortunate to receive the funding that you mentioned uh, from Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And what we really want to do is try to better understand the mental health impacts of COVID-19. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of attention on finding a vaccine, that's very important work. There's been less attention given to the mental health aspects and impacts of COVID-19 and what we can do about it both now and following the pandemic, which will end eventually. But then what is the, the fallout of that going to be both in terms of uh, mental health and the need for treatment? So we're asking a whole array of questions about the way uh, COVID-19 is affecting us, uh, you know, in terms of uh, stress, in terms of 
the way we lead our daily lives in terms of the way we behave in response to those uncertainties and unknowns. And, you know, really, um, it's a quite comprehensive uh, assessment of those issues. Would it be safe to assume that something like PTSD or hand washing habits where you rub your hands till they're raw and bleeding? Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. And so there's a couple of steps to, to, to go into trying to understand something like a stress response to an unprecedented situation like COVID-19. So we learned some things about the psychology of pandemics from some of the previous pandemics like SARS and H1N1, but on a relative scale compared to what people are experiencing now, those were quite minor. Nobody experienced the changes to their lives that we've all been asked to make, some of which you were alluding to in, in your introduction. And so what we have to do is find a way, as psychologists, we have to find a way to measure these um, impacts. You know, how do we understand? Well, we ask questions, but we need valid and reliable tools to try and understand those. So as part of our research, in asking these questions, we're also trying to validate some scales that assess what that response looks like. And so one of the first outcomes of our research is um, something called the COVID stress scales. And those are actually just accepted for publication in a journal called the Journal of Anxiety Disorders. And the COVID stress scales measure um, measure five aspects of the response to um, to COVID-19. And those fall into uh, some of the categories that you just mentioned, and, and they characterize the way people are responding. Um, of course, along a continuum. So some may score high, some may score low, but the five, the five aspects of the stress response appear to be um, symptoms related to uh, fears or stress around the danger uh, and contamination related to COVID-19, fears about the economic consequences, uh, xenophobia, which is fears about um, foreigners or other groups that are not perceived to be part of our own group, um, compulsive checking and reassurance seeking. And so the, the, the washing that you mentioned would be uh, falling into that category. And then traumatic stress symptoms about COVID-19. So a lot of people are having intrusive images about the virus, um, you know, when they don't want to be thinking about it. People are having a lot of COVID-19 related dream content. And so, yeah, we're seeing not only compulsive washing and trauma related responses, but also fears about contamination, economic consequences, and these out groups who might be um, perceived by some as uh, being responsible for transmission of the virus. Of those many things you just listed, is any of it normal or predictable? That's also a very good question. Uh, in response to uncertainties like this, many of those things are normal. Many of them are predictable um, in terms of what we know from prior uh, pandemics. So yeah, you know, if people are feeling uh, afraid and, and um, have fears of contamination and are checking or having these dreams, those are all normal parts of our emotional response to, to stress and uncertainty. Now, if they persist over long periods of time or they start in, impacting our ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, keeping in mind that a lot of our um, functional parameters are significantly altered under the current circumstances. But if, it, if it's really having a negative impact, then it becomes a little bit more than um, something that's a normal response. Now, I don't know if that makes sense, but basically I'm saying, yes, it's okay for people to have emotional responses, but depending on the d degree to which they impact their daily lives over an extended period of time, they may be something that's um, becoming a, more of a concern. 
when we talk about these impacts, what does that mean for society? Does that mean it's going to cost us money or people are going to lose their jobs because they they need treatment or maybe don't have treatment? Yeah, but I don't think that um, it means that people necessarily you know, lose their jobs as a consequence of, of experiencing these things. I think the impact is going to be on the treatment end of it. And, you know, at present, providing mental health services is difficult and challenging, regardless of what the focus of that is. So we've had to change much the way that physicians have had to change some of their um, practices, you know, doing telephone consults. Um, mental health professionals are not providing treatment um, in person for the most part. Uh, there may be some exceptions, but a lot of it's being done by telemedicine and uh, being done through um, internet delivered therapy, for example. And I guess as it relates specifically to what we're referring to as COVID stress syndrome, which would be sort of heightened responses across all of those domains, which we're seeing in about 25% of the population, by the way. Um, Is that normal? Well, it means that 25% of the population are very hard hit emotionally by this. And again, this isn't affecting us all um, the same way because we all have different parameters uh, that have been affected, right? Different people um, have had different components of their lives changed, or some of us have more social support than others. Some of us are still working. Some of us have lost jobs. So it's not a one size fits all. But what we know is that 25%, approximately 25% have been hit very hard by this emotionally, and they may require some specific supports. Right now, the mental health supports that are available are probably general, you know, general coping strategies or how do I deal with stress generally? What do I do? There are a lot of resources available online, a lot of recommendations that people have been making to cope with stress, but there's going to be a need for some very tailored and specific strategies for people who have this COVID stress syndrome. Those aren't available yet and are, you know, currently something that we're working hard to develop. Currently, my strategy is to eat lots of food. That's bad for me. And my <laughs> wife's like, you need to put down the chips. <laughs> and one of the other things I've been doing is being very conscious um, of my alcohol consumption. So I'm limiting myself yeah. to maximum one beer per day just because I, yeah. I have a personal concern that I wouldn't want to become dependent or overconsume in a time of massive stress. And I was, I was talking about this with my friend who's a psychiatrist and he wasn't joking when he said beer is going to be one of those essential coping tools because people aren't going to have the resources to seek help. They're not going to have, they might not even want to go seek help. And I didn't, I couldn't really believe it. I was like, that sounds counterintuitive from a, at least everything I understand, but maybe he had a different perspective. Yeah. So there's a couple of interesting things to consider around that strategy. And I, I was looking for some data to see whether there's been an increase in sales of alcohol, for example. And I don't know uh, whether that, that um, I wasn't able to find any data on that. Uh, we do have some data that show people are, you know, consuming alcohol uh, as a way of coping. We haven't been able to look yet at um, whether people, you know, who are having more stressful responses are drinking more compared to those who are having less stressful responses. We don't no, yet we haven't looked at that data. But interestingly, along the lines that you were mentioning, when people um, quarantine, 
so when people have quarantined, there's a recent meta-analysis of studies on quarantine. And what that is, is it's a study that looks at the results of a bunch of other studies. And this was pub published recently in the journal Lancet. And um, what they found is that the mental health impacts of quarantine are more significant when quarantine occurs for longer periods of time. Uh, particularly 10 days or longer. Now, many of us have been uh, self-isolating for much longer than that already. Quarantine and by inference self-isolation also becomes more difficult um, at the, the mental health level when there's a lack of essential um, supplies, you know, things that are uh, considered essential to day-to-day -day living. Now, in the U.S., the average person drinks about 500 drinks per year, which is a little over one per day, right? So you would think, given that degree of consumption, that um, having a drink, whether it's a beer or something else, um, is essential because, you know, everybody has, you know, one to two per day. So if you were to take that away, that would be one of those essentials that would make um, would decrease mental health. So being able to have, you know, a, a beer at, at a particular time during the day, uh, while we're self-isolating certainly seems, um, to be beneficial in that it's one of those essential components. So there's, I mean, there's some, some, um, train of logic there, but I, like you have also, um, found that having, you know, one, one beer a day, I enjoy it. Um, I'm not going to have any more, uh, maybe, you know, on, on Friday or Saturday night when we're watching a movie or something, I might have two, but you know, there seems to be, um, uh, some benefit to that in moderation. I have looked at the literature, um, to see if there have been recent reviews about, um, the benefits of beer or alcohol to mental health. And, I think the jury is really out on that. And it's really one of these things where in moderation, yes. On the other end of the spectrum, there's all kinds of concerns because too much alcohol can also reduce our um, immune functioning and could make us more susceptible to, to COVID-19 or any other um, potential viral infections. So, yeah. I kind of uh, have a personal rule if it's, a work function, I'll have one and then I stop because I've just seen some people get out of control and I've, I felt it was better to learn from them than make the mistake and learn it myself. And now that I'm in quarantine, I'm like, I'm going to make sure I have a full supper and a beer and, and pair those two experiences together. And instead of making it beer for beer's sake, it's going to be beer for uh, an experience with my family that is something more to appreciate rather than to indulge or binge. Right. Yeah. I can't say the same about potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you're, you're pairing, you know, the particular beer with the meal and trying to make it an experience. Yeah. And that's another um, part of what people have been doing to, to cope. Many people have been trying um, new recipes. Many people who didn't cook before you know, have taken on cooking, um, you know, and, and other new hobbies, you know, and pairing that uh, um, with different types of, of beer, for example, becomes something not, um, not drinking a beer to cope necessarily, but drinking a beer as part of a bigger experience. You know, and I, I like that idea. And again, you know, um, when used in moderation, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. This is going to be a little bit of a shameless plug, but one of the things about socially isolating, it's forced us to close our tap room, but we also turned up the delivery nature of beer. So now you can go to websites. There are about three or four different sources where you can get beer delivered to your house. And, this week, I'm going to get some pineapple sour from Rebellion delivered. Brand new. Nice. Yeah. 
Have you taken advantage of any of the delivery services? Uh, no. Um, I'm the a family member who has been tasked with going out uh, of the house to do the shopping. So, you know, I, I have a couple of regular stops and I'm able to actually pick up my favorite uh, um, beer. And it, it actually happens to be uh, one of the Rebellion IPAs. So, yeah, I've been able to, to get that on my own um, at, the local, uh, at the local stop. Wow, thank you. You're going to help put my kids through college. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um yeah, this is uh, you know, it's uh it's it's interesting to see the changes to the way that people are having to conduct not only their day-to-day -day lives, but also having to conduct their their business. And you know, the same is true at the university. There's been wholesale changes to the way that all universities have had to deliver uh, courses and and you know how they're having to to change to meet the immediate needs and, and possibly future needs as well and it's quite likely that some of the changes that businesses and organizations like universities are having to make are going to have some carry forward because we're learning new ways of doing things i will admit it was a professor from the university of regina scott wilson who was helping me test out Zoom so I could oh, do yeah. some teleconferencing because he's been hosting his classes over Zoom. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, Zoom has uh, definitely become a staple in uh, sort of my day-to-day -day work. Our research team meets by Zoom. Uh, in fact, when we're done this, I'm going to be hopping on to a Zoom meeting with the research team and... Uh, you know, that, that's become a regular way. I know my son has a meeting with his uh, grade eight classroom. Um, they're using some other platform, but, uh, but you know, they're meeting virtually the same way. So certainly. One of the things I noticed in the interviews you were conducting over multiple uh, news agencies, I just found it tempting to want to compare the experiences of different countries. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm tempted to ask you about maybe a comparison between Canada and the United States. Do we have insights in, in different things we're learning about different populations? Or does that even matter? In, in terms of their um, emotional response to, to what's going on or. Yeah. Like we're, we're seeing some really different behaviors. Um, what we maybe what you might call pro social where we're helping each other out with giving free meals or right collaborating to um do hand sanitizer with small businesses here in regina because the store shelves are all empty is, right are you seeing differences between the two countries at all or is that is it too early yeah so as part of our work and probably part of the work some others are doing um we'll probably get some insights into that. So our, our study is a multi-wave study where, you know, we've completed wave one, um, which was uh, done late March. And we looked at um, both uh, Canadian and U.S. citizens, uh, about 3,500 from each country. And, you know, in part we've done that because we, we do want to do some cross national comparisons uh, we haven't done those yet um, and you know we may or may not see differences in waves two and three in addition to some of the things we've already looked at and we'll be following the same people over time so we can see changes in you know from the same sample but in waves uh, two which is happening um, uh, next week so about a month from the time we wrapped up wave one and then the other will be further down the down the line about two more months from wrap up of wave two we're going to be looking at altruistic behaviors you know so so you know the helping behaviors that some people have started uh, to do changes in the way uh, people are um, refitting businesses to 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 provide things that are needed. But we're also looking at um, behaviors that are uh, contrary to the public health recommendations and measures. So I haven't seen too much in Canada, although I did see on the news this morning that um, a, a, a 
church in Ontario is going to be facing some charges from the RCMP for violating the um, sort of the no gathering uh, restrictions. You know, but if we look to the U.S., um, I saw uh, on the news this morning 50,000 people on one beach in California, and we've seen the protests that are that are arising around the social distancing measures in Wisconsin, for example, which is one of the states where there, there's a rising number of cases and, and in other states as well. So, you know, we're looking at both the altruistic behaviors, but also the behaviors that, um, that may help um, continue spread of the virus and not help mitigate it. Wisconsin is one of the reasons I wanted to ask you about the United States because I have family members there. And when we talked to them on Skype, one of them was like, I'm not doing anything to change my behavior. He's like, this is all overblown. I, it's kind of a hoax thing. He's like, I'm not socially isolating. I go out for coffee every day. He's like, I'm never, I don't care. I'm not going to listen. He's like, you're all way too scared. And it floored us because we had been socially isolating for two weeks and yeah. here he was like, nah, not doing it. Yeah. I mean, and you, you can see that, um, across the States when you watch the news, you can see, you know, diff very different responses within the same state, you know, where people are, uh, social isolating and where others aren't, you know, even in, in New York, the hardest hit where I actually have uh, friends and colleagues who haven't left their house in almost two months, even to get groceries, you know, having, having it delivered. And then there's other people crowded on the streets. And, you know, there are individual difference factors that, that play into that. Um, some people have what we call an uh, over-optimism bias, and they, you know, they feel that um, things are being exaggerated and it's really not as bad as it is. And I'm not going to be affected and I'm not going to get this. One of the problems with the over-optimism bias is that um, in the context of this situation, it can be adaptive and it can be protective um, because it doesn't allow people to go to worst case scenarios and become as stressed. But in the context of a pandemic where it's not just about you, it's about others that you interact with, um, it can become problematic because, yeah, you might not get sick, but you might be carrying it and you might give it to grandma and grandpa. And we all know the outcomes of um, situations like that or the potential outcomes of situations like that. One of the things that can, seems to concern me lately is people keep saying it's, oh, it's, it's just old people. And then you see some older people saying, well, I'll just take one for the team. And I'm like, I just had a childhood friend who was 36 years old. He, he passed away a couple weeks ago from COVID. And I, I I'm not content with that narrative. Like, I, sorry, I'm going to go on a rant here, but I just feel like some people are immune to facts and evidence and it wouldn't matter how much you gave them to read or what evidence you could put before them. You, you couldn't reason with them. They wouldn't care. I think to myself, how do we manage these people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's a very tough question. And it, it's one that, uh, I mean, I have images of a, of a particular um, leader come into my head when you uh, phrase things that way, but you know, I'll, the way that um, a nation gets through this is by taking cues from uh, science and our understanding of what we know. And again, there's a lot of unknowns, but what we know from the scientists about the way that the virus behaves from mental health scientists about the way, you know, we can help maintain our, our, mental stability and mental health, but also from our leadership. So it's really those three um, components that are a core piece of how nations respond collectively. And 
and depending on what the leadership is is telling us uh, and whether we can put trust in the leadership, we're going to behave one way or the other. And um, yeah, there's, there's quite different types of leadership in North America in terms of the way uh, they're, they're handling this, you know. Um, so yeah, maybe without getting too political, you know, you leave it at that. But you know, if people are following the lead of, um, of somebody who really is invested in science or evidence and just opinion, then they're going to uh, be prone to not listen to science and they're going to be prone to behaviors that um, are more along the lines of some of the things you mentioned in the opening with some of the ludicrous suggestions about how somebody might treat um, the virus or, or tackle the virus. Unfortunately, I haven't heard about anybody ingesting um, things that they shouldn't be ingesting to kill the virus, but maybe we haven't heard about that yet. I've seen a couple of news stories where they talked about uh, calls to poison control had spiked after the bleach comments. Yeah. Uh, just, it boggles my mind. Um, so you said second wave of your research is going to be coming out soon. Yeah. The, the, the second wave um, of surveying will begin on May 1st. Yeah. So, and it'll be the same, um, you know, roughly 7,000 people that'll be contacted and, uh, and followed up. And, you know, we expect those responses to be in within about a week's time. And then we'll actually be able to look at, um, at uh, changes in behavior over the course of uh, the period between April 1st and probably the middle of May, for example. Uh, yeah. Is this research going to be published publicly really quickly or is it going to be something that's analyzed over months? Yeah, it's all, um, it's all ongoing. So like our COVID stress scales I mentioned have been accepted for publication and, um, you know, should be publicly available uh, within the next few days. And, um, you know, we're working on other papers that um, from wave one that can sort of take a snapshot or a cross section um, of what's happening. So we're working on those right now, but it's the longitudinal data. So that sort of from time one to time two and looking into the future that will be most interesting. And um, yeah, certainly we'll be publishing that. One of the most interesting pieces that we're hoping to get out quickly from the, the longitudinal wave two data has to do with the vaccination hesitancy. So, you know, we know that about 20% of people for a variety of reasons say that should a vaccine become available, uh, they're less likely to take it. But we want to see if that changed, you know, if that's changed from where it was at on April 1st through to probably the middle of May. You know, we might see some changes, maybe more people become hesitant or maybe fewer people become hesitant about vaccines. And then we'll be able to look at predictors of, of that hesitancy. I noticed you use the term uh, hesitancy versus anti-vax, which is maybe more hostile. <laughs> is why are you taking a more neutral approach or more neutral language? Well, I think that's, you know, the way scientists, uh, you know, including mental health scientists approach things from just basically we want um, evidence, uh, you know, and while we might have opinions and, you know, personal preferences, it's really just about um, understanding uh, the evidence. So, Vaccine hesitancy uh, is a less is a less um, uh, laden term, for lack of a better way of putting it. Right, so it it, it does bring up um, you know you know whether it's it's a good thing or a bad thing. There's hesitancy, and it could be for a variety of reasons. Was there hesitancy around things like polio or TB? Um, yeah, historically. I, yeah, I think that, again, if we look at the literature I, I, and we look at um, situations where people were confronted with unknowns, 
and then the development of new things to help treat it, there's always some questions around, you know, is this going to be good in the short term? Is it going to be good in the midterm? Is it going to be good in the long term? You know, what do we know about effects over time? And so there's questions around those historically related to some of those things, that, other situations that you mentioned. Um, yeah, in the current context, um, a lot of the efforts and a lot of the strategies of different nations are hinged on um, finding a vaccine. And that, you know, I, I believe that's a good pursuit. And I, I've heard language change to not hinging everything on a vaccine, but hinging a lot on a vaccine. But there's other things that have to be done. But if one in five people or more than one in five people are not likely to take a vaccination and, and we continue to see the um, the virus to be as infectious as it is and when we don't see things mitigating that becomes a concern of a different sort yeah so we know your research is going to be coming out over the next few weeks where's the best place that people can follow up if if they've listened to the podcast yeah that that, that um, we actually have developed a website where we are posting um, our publications and we're also posting information that can help people who are looking for, at, at this point, general strategies for coping, um, you know, finding ways that they may not have thought of or, or, or programs that may help them with coping. And then this is where we'll also be launching um, more specific coping strategies once we've had a chance to develop and and uh, evaluate them, but that's um, coronaphobia.org. So coronaphobia.org is that site, and that uh, people will find it has a header Saipan Network. So it's the Psychology of Pandemics Network, which is a group of um, mental health investigators working together to try and um, better understand and and uh, help people help themselves at this point uh, in dealing with uh, stress and life changes related to this pandemic. Okay. Last question, big takeaway. What is the most important thing people need to know about their mental health when it comes to coronavirus right now? Right now? Well, I think the most important thing is for people to understand that having a response an emotional response to this. Now, we've had some time to have that emotional response, uh, but having that emotional response is perfectly understandable. But the way people respond is not, again, one size fits all because there's so many different ways in which people have been affected and impacted. But I think the most important thing is for people to recognize if they're having a significant change in the way they are behaving or feeling emotionally, or if somebody's pointed that out and then to be open to trying to do something about it, you know, and that there is, there, you know, if they need to talk to somebody or if they just need to find some space, it's okay to take a few minutes and, um, try and blow off some steam, try and manage your stress. This all sounds very easy to do. And it can be if somebody understands how to do that. So I think that's the most important thing is for people to take control. The only thing you really are in control of is yourself. And if you're feeling out of control, then try and take the reins and get back into control, whether that's through stress management, um, breathing exercises, uh, some people are doing yoga, you know, a lot of people can't work out, but you actually can just maybe not in the way you did before. So, you know, uh, walk or do some calisthenics or, you know, grab something heavy and, you know, start lifting that. But these are different ways to find a new hobby, connect with friends like you and I are chatting right now. Some people are having dinner parties like this, right? Or, or they're sitting down to have their nightly beer with friends like this, you know, so a happy hour virtually. All of those things, this is a long answer to the most important thing. But the most important thing is to try and find some control. Because if we're feeling a lack of control, if you can find something that 
gives you a sense of control, you're going to feel better. Well, Dr. Gordon, I want to thank you for your time today. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. It's been great. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Cheers. Rebels, thanks for listening today. I'm going to include links in the show notes so you can find more about Dr. Gordon's research and work online. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, be sure to join us on our brand new Facebook group page, The Rebellion Brewing Podcast. I'm also proud to let you know about a brand new podcast by good friend Kevin Brown. He's a familiar face in the craft beer scene, and his new show is called Holy Fuck, It's a Music Podcast, where he interviews tons of local people involved in the music scene, including Mark Heisey, the president and CEO of Rebellion Brewing. I'll be sure to include links in the show notes so you can find it. The SAS craft beer scene is always changing, and I'm going to do my best to keep featuring all the new local beers coming out from the comfort of my own basement. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped so you don't miss out on a single thing. Thank you for joining the Rebellion.